Hey everybody, welcome to T-Roy Cooks. Appreciate you joining us again. This is another Thursday chatting with Troy. This is where I answer your questions. So I've got a list of questions here, ready to go. And uh, man, if y'all missed that Thursday chat last Thursday with Justin from Baby Back Maniac, y'all need to check that out. That was a fun, fun time me and Justin had, man. And um, I just put up a uh, brisket, a bone-in brisket video that he joined me on as well for uh, this past Tuesday. Y'all go check that out. Fabulous, fabulous guy. And I'm so proud to call him my friend. If you're not subscribed to Baby Back Maniac, please do so. He's, he's got a great channel and he's going to be a future superstar here one day. I'll, I'll bet you. He's got some good content. Um, cheers to all y'all out there. My last couple of chats were pretty long. I've been trying to catch up on these questions. So um, I think I'm probably about four weeks behind now. So I'm, I'm gradually catching up. But uh, this is where I answer your questions. Like I said, if I mention any YouTubers or any products that you may be interested in, or if you're looking for some way to find me on social media and stuff, just hit show more down beneath the video. If you've got a full, full screen, shrink it down just a little bit and you'll see the show more button right beneath the video. That'll open the description box, find a ton of good information in there. Woo, it's hot out here today, man. We're getting close to 100 degrees. I think it's gonna be like 97 today here in Austin. Let's get to it, folks. Uh, Jerry Crabe. Troy, love these videos. I've seen most of them are at least 40 minutes long with some longer. My question is, how in the heck do you make one beer last that long? Cheers. <laughs> Alright, Jerry. <laughs> Cheers, man. <laughs> it's because I just take a sip. I don't sit there and gulp it down, man. But uh, I'm sure as it gets hotter, I may have to go get me more than one beer. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate it. Thanks for the support, Jerry. The Holla Barbecue, the Holla BBQ. Again, he's got a channel, y'all. Hit show more, find the Holla BBQ down below. All right, he says, hopefully one day I can be like you, Troy, and have months worth of questions to be answered. <laughs> I hear you, man. Uh, I got like some great fans. I really do, man. He says, my question for you is, what was the defining moment on YouTube that you saw a huge subscriber growth? Was there any one thing in particular? Thanks for the videos. Oh, I've never really seen, like, all of a sudden a large number of subscribers. Just slowly over time, it builds up. Uh, at least it, it did that with me. I mean, um, I guess I could account some of it to doing videos for low bills because they've got their own customer base and when they put one of my videos on their website or include it in one of their weekly newsletters or promote me and my videos on their social media that does help bring more traffic to my youtube channel so uh, some of those people i'm sure did subscribe but uh that if anything at all i would say getting with uh, a larger company that you're comfortable working with they can help promote you with their own customer base and get word out that you're actually doing cooking videos. So, if anything at all, I'd say Lil Bell's helped me. But again, it, it was just a it was a gradual increase. It wasn't like I had 5,000 and then a week later had 10,000. It didn't happen that way. I mean, it's it took me a, quite a while. I think when I started with Lil Bell's, I had 6,000 subscribers, and that was uh, about two and a half years ago. So look at me now. I mean, I just gradually, and I, as I've mentioned before, the more subscribers you have the more there are that watch you and those people will tell their friends and family about you and it just starts spreading like wildfire I mean it takes a lot uh, longer to get from zero to 1,000 subscribers than it does to get from you know 1,000 to 5,000 it it's weird but you, you grow exponentially the more subs you have the faster your growth is so I hope that helps but keep up the great work man you got a great channel going too appreciate the question and thanks for the support Next question, uh, Gregory Andre Andreato. Andreata. Sorry, Greg. Troy, after many months of lurking on your channel and watching your videos, I finally subscribed today. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it, man. Sorry, bro, for taking so long to subscribe. Eh, it's alright. It happens, you know. It says, I have a question about your Yoder Wichita. I'm in the market for an offset smoker, and I've been going back and forth on which one to get seen online that the Wichita has temp issues side to side mainly due to the design of the Wichita 
Do you experience that at all? Nope. I actually like having a different side to side. I've got mine set up that way and you can adjust the uh, heat management plate, like tuning plates basically. You can adjust it so that you get an even temp. What some people do not realize with an offset, the airflow through your offset depends on the wind direction. You know, where you have your pit situated in your yard. Um, if, for instance, my, my firebox is on the north end. My smokestack's on the south end. So when that southern breeze comes through here, bringing, uh, you know, rain off the Gulf of Mexico and all that coming in, that wind's blowing from south to north. So it's going from my stack end back towards my firebox end. And that's the reverse of the way it should flow. It should flow from your firebox out the stack. So sometimes that will cause me to need to open my firebox door a little bit. You'll just crack it maybe an inch or so just to get some airflow going the right way. But uh, as far as the issues, no man. I don't have any issues really with the side to side or anything like that. I think Yoda makes a fabulous pit. Uh, let's see, Greg also asks, how often do you tend your fire on an overnight cook? Keep up the awesome work. Well, usually if, if the logs that I have, they're, they're about yay big around, and then they're split into quarters. So I've got, you know, four quarters in one log, and they're about 18 inches long. And uh, I've had other people ask me real quick, where did I get my wood here locally? I get it from Butler Cooking Wood. And they have a website, I'll put it down below if you're in the Austin area, but they deliver and stack the wood for you. They're a little more, more pricey, but they deliver and stack it for you. And uh, I've always had real good luck with them. I've ordered, ordered from them three or four times now. But uh, they're great and they, they cover Central and South Texas. Um, all right, how often do I tend the fire? I would say I use those quarter logs, like I mentioned, the sticks, and I throw one on once every 45 minutes to an hour once the, once the pit's up to temp. And it probably takes three of those to get it up to temp, but once it's up to temp, just one every 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the size of the wood and the wind and all that good stuff, but just a general idea anyway. Appreciate the question, Greg, and thanks again for the subscription, man. I appreciate it. Matt Covington. How you doing, Matt? Cheers to you, my friend. You've been around a while, man. Appreciate the support. Let's see what Matt says. How often do you grill out? Um, man, every day if I can, to be honest with you. Every once in a while, like this evening, I'm cooking a, a, a spaghetti and corn dish that I've made on video before. I'm doing that inside in the kitchen. I'm not filming it today, but that's what I'm cooking inside today. But, uh, man, I did some uh, some steaks outside the other day. Uh, uh, me and Karen cooked some fish. Uh, hmm. What was it? Oh, I know. We did hamburger steaks one night, too, inside. So I would say probably three or four times a week is, is what I do outside. So... You know, and, and I've got my, my covered area out here, my pergola and all that, covering my, my pits and all that. Plus, I've got this gas grill sitting right to my right right here under the porch. So, my pits are covered. I don't have to worry about it raining and, you know, getting me all wet and all that or putting the fire out. Anyway. <clears throat> what else you got for me, Matt? He says, uh, also, do you have any favorite quick meals you like to put together during the week where you are more crunched for time? I just mentioned them. Hamburger steak's one of them. Um... <laughs> I put a video link up here for you. And also that corner spaghetti dish that I'm making tonight. I put that link up here for you as well. <laughs> Good timing, man. Maybe I should read these questions before I answer them. <laughs> he says, uh, I always look forward to more from you and wishing you all the best. Take care, brother. Take care, Matt. Appreciate the support, man. <laughs> uh, next question is from Preston Buffington. Hi, T. Roy, longtime fan. I love these Q&A vids. Thanks, Preston. Appreciate the support, man. <clears throat> awesome channel. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys all make it happen, though. I mean, you know, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy the teaching aspect of it, and I enjoy the, the camaraderie, the, the, uh, 
getting to know all of you folks, you know, and, and letting you get to know me a little bit better too. That's that's what makes these Q and A's pretty pretty nice in my opinion. All right, Preston says, question: If cooking a brisket under a pork butt, won't the drippings from the pork butt wash off the rub of the brisket at the beginning of the cook? Um, it it could, but um, usually it doesn't drip that much. I mean, by the time that that heat gets within the pork butt and some of that fat starts rendering and you start getting the drips, usually the bark is starting to form on, on the brisket down below. Um, anyway, that, that's been what I found anyway. But, you know, if you're worried about it, I guess you could always try to wire up some kind of a catch pan or something underneath your pork butt, you know, to, like a grease pan or something, a little shallow one. But... I've never, I've never had an issue with it, Preston. Let's see if you got any more questions here for me. Come on, man. My liquor ain't working again. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, da, 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 da. He says, also, will the drippings from the pork butt have an adverse effect on the flavor of the brisket being cooked underneath? I suppose it could, but again, I've never experienced that. Um, the only thing I wouldn't put above a brisket would be chicken. In fact, I wouldn't put anything under chicken. Chicken, I would always put on the bottom, but pork's not, not that bad. And brisket, if you want to put brisket over pork, that'll work too, either way. You know, I've, I've never really had an issue with it. He says, also wondering if it'd be safe having raw meat drippings falling onto the meat being cooked on the bottom rack before having reached a safe internal temp. I'm sure there's some science that would corroborate what you're saying. But, again, I've never had any issues with it, man. As long as I'm not putting chicken on top of something, you know, as long as the chicken's on the bottom and everything else can go on the top. That's the way that I've always done it, and it's always worked out great for me. I've never had any issues, man. But give it a shot, you know. Do some re research. There's a bunch of information on it online, I know. Uh, Food and Drug Administration and stuff probably got some stuff out there. Uh, United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, you know. Anyway, there's, I'm sure there's a ton of information out there. I just, I don't know all the science behind it. But I've never had any issues. I've never been sick from getting any contaminated food or anything like that. Um, not that I've cooked anyway. I've been to restaurants and gotten contaminated food. That ain't cool. But at any rate, I appreciate the question, Preston. Thanks, man. Yeah, that was Preston. All right. El Frontier, El, El Fronterizo. Sorry, I messed your name up, man. But El Fronterizo. Where are the gas grill cooking videos? Uh, I've got a few of them. I, I haven't done them in a while, though. Uh, and like I've mentioned before, I've got so many different cookers. I, I just kind of spread the love. So I've had other requests to do some more gas grill cooking. So I'll do some more of it here coming up. Okay. He says, I use all your wood charcoal tips, but I have a propane grill I don't really use, but I think I should use it more. Me, I'm more of a charcoal wood grilling guy. Yeah, I'm the same way. I mean, the, you know, honestly, Kieran uses the gas grill a lot uh, more than I do <laughs> um, because you can just fire it up, and within 10, 15 minutes, you're ready to cook. With charcoal, you've got 20 to 30 minutes before that charcoal gets ready, so... You know, if you're in a hurry on a weeknight and you've got other plans, you got stuff to do, and you're in a hurry to get something cooked, gas grill's the way to go. But you don't get that same flavor that you would off of charcoal or real wood. Uh, but anyway, I appreciate the question, and uh, yeah, I'll try to do some more grill on, on the gas grill for you, okay? I've got a natural gas DCS grill. So appreciate the suggestion and, and the request. Wolfgang Hood. What's up, Doc? How you doing, man? Wolfgang says, uh, I tried smoking skinless, boneless chicken breast for the first time, and it tasted like chicken-flavored sawdust. Woo! It's as dry as it can be. Any pointers to what did what I did wrong? First time doing smoked meat. Tastes like sawdust, huh? Hmm. Huh. Um, I'd say maybe cooking it too fast, you know, too hot, or too long. Boneless, skinless. Um, I always found that getting the bone in chicken works a whole lot better. 
not only does it add more flavor, it helps keep the meat moist. But um, instead of breasts, try chicken thighs. Chicken thighs work really, really well. Or better yet, chicken leg quarters. That's the thigh and the leg. Love me some chicken leg quarters on my smoker, man. That is some good stuff. And uh, I usually cook about 225 to 250 Fahrenheit. And right at the very end, like once the chicken gets up to around uh, 150, 145, 150 internal Fahrenheit, I'll crank the heat up to about 325 or so. And at that point, I'll finish cooking it, and that'll help crisp that skin up. Because if you don't do that, you just cook it the whole time, low and slow, until it's done, your chicken skin is going to be rubbery. Um, and that's another thing, too. Try smoking chicken with the skin on. So get chicken with the bone and get chicken with the skin. You go on boneless, skinless, you're going to need to baste it. Or rub, you know, melt some butter and, and baste your chicken with that or some barbecue sauce or something to help it retain some moisture. Because it will turn out dry on you. Because you're cooking at a low temp, smoking it, and it's going to dry it out naturally. you got to keep it moist. Or just spritz it if you want. But uh, I would I would baste it with some butter or some barbecue sauce or something to help keep it moist, especially the breast. Boneless, skinless breast is dry to begin with. Um, you may also want to try injecting it. If you try the boneless, skinless, try injecting it. In fact, get some of that marinade from Heaven Made Products that I used on that, uh, that pork roast. That was excellent. I actually overcooked it a little bit. I pulled it off and it was about 185 internal. And um, I should have pulled it off when it was about, you know, one, probably about 150, 145 to 150 internal. So I overcooked it. But it was still real juicy, and it's because of that Heaven Made product marinade. So, uh, oh, and if you do do that, if you go get you some Heaven Made products, y'all don't forget to use the promo code TROY20 when you're checking out. to save you 20%. I mean, Mike, Mike actually offered to, to give me a portion of the proceeds from a sale, and I was like, no, nah, man. I want my subscribers to get a discount instead of me getting the money from that. So that's for you folks. Use Troy20 when you're checking out at HeavenMadeProducts.com. Save yourself 20% 20, 20 off your order. Appreciate that, Mike. All right, let's see. Uh, Condola's Kitchen. He's got a great channel, too. Go check him out. Link down below. Troy, question for you. I live in a condo complex and I'm not able to have a gas grill, just electric. Is there... Is there any way you're able to smoke using an electric grill? Yep, you sure can. Get you some saw. Uh, you all you can use sawdust, I was fixing to say. But uh, wood chips. And you know what? The I looked up one time. Somebody I've had this question before. Somebody asked me if there was an indoor smoker. And there is one that you can actually use in your oven or on your stove top. I'll put a link to it. It's on Amazon and it's. I think it's, made, it's called Budweiser Indoor Smoker or something like that. But check my Amazon affiliate links down below in the description box. Just hit show more. And uh, I'll put it down there for you. But if you can use your electric smoker on your porch, then yeah, use some wood chips. And you may want to soak them for about 30 minutes before you use them and, and shake the water out before you put them on your electric element. But that will definitely produce some smoke for you. Um, the only other thing I can mention is maybe get one of these uh, smoke, it's not really a smoke generator, but uh, it's, it, I, it's like a tube and you put wood pellets in it or wood dust and light one end and it'll slowly uh, go through the tube and release smoke into the uh, cooking chamber. And if I can find one of those on Amazon, I'll put that in the Amazon links too. So check out the Amazon links below in my description condola. Appreciate it, man. <clears throat> Next question from Jason Sanitz. Hey, brother, maybe a silly question, but what's your preferred method of maintaining your knives, like sharpening your knives? He says, it seems the little details make for better time cooking. I'm personally, I personally am still searching for the best method. All advice is welcome. Cheers, brother. Uh, I'd say probably every three or four uses. I'll just run my knife through one of those knife sharpening things that, you know, you slide through. It's got the coarse and the fine side. Uh, the one I've got is made by Wustoff. And if, if I don't feel like doing that, I've also got a steel. You know, the, the stick on the handle that you, you know, do your knife along it. And it, uh, it helps sharpen it that way. Uh, but usually I just use the, the little small thing you just run your knife through and it'll, 
your coarse and then do the fine and it sharpens it pretty good that way. Uh, let's see. Yeah, ain't nothing worse than a dull knife, man. Keep your knives sharp. And they're safer for you, too. Uh, next question is from D Fernando 7861 Love the videos, Troy. Hey, thanks, man. Appreciate that. Cheers to you. That's getting parched. <laughs> All right. He says, uh, I was wondering, what's your input on offset vertical smokers and over under pits? Um, a smoker's a smoker, regardless of how it's designed. I mean, it's, you get some fine smoked meat off of it. Uh, the vertical smokers are fantastic. I like them because you can hang sausages and stuff in them. You can hang ribs in them. Heck, you can even hang brisket and stuff like you would in a pit barrel cooker. Uh, so vertical smokers really, really work great. And also, usually you've got multiple layers of different trays, so they're great for jerky. Uh, you can do low and slow with some cheese, you know, cold smoked salmon and cheese and stuff in there. Um, they usually have a lot more room than a regular offset that's laid out side by side, you know. Um, and the over under, I man, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure what you mean by over under. Uh, also, he says, I have a 14 inch w Web, uh, Weber Smoky Mountain, 14 inch WSM, and looking to upgrade to a bigger smoker, what would you recommend? Um, I, it always depends on the money, man. The money's the main factor in all these decisions for what smoker. If, I mean, personally, I like the Weber Smoky Mountains. I really do. They're the best bang for the buck. If you can afford the 22 inch, that's what I would suggest you get. You know, you've already got experience with the 14. Just crank that up, you know, several times and you've got the 22 inch. A lot, a lot of real estate. You can put a lot of meat on that thing, man. <coughs> And it'll function the same way as your 14. So you're already used to that one. Why not just upgrade and get you a larger Weber Smoky Mountain? That's what I would do. If you want real wood flavor, though, you're going to have to upgrade to a, uh, an offset. And the food flavor is better off an offset, but it's a lot more work trying to tend to that fire during the entire cook. So you got to think about that. Do you, do you really want to sit out there and tend to the fire? During the entire cook, especially like a brisket or pork butt cook that's going to be 12 plus hours, it's up to you, man. I love it. I like doing it. And I love the food that comes off of it. But my second choice would be the Weber Smoky Mountain. So that's what I would suggest for you. Appreciate the support. Thanks, man. <clears throat> 34, Bill Sharp. Hey, T. Roy, I have a question. Have you ever thought about getting an insulated cabinet or a gravity feed smoker? Nope. Not really. Um, I don't really have a need for an insulated cabinet. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I guess I could see where that would come in handy, but I, I don't really I don't really need one. And a gravity feed smoker. I don't really need one of those either, man. I mean, I've I've got I've got all that I need here. I mean, it's always nice to have new toys to play with, but then if I get another smoker, that just means I'm going to not spend as much time with the ones I've got. So, I mean, there's that, you know. But, uh, you know, if I had one to play around with, that'd be cool, but I'm not going to go out and get one. He says, uh, he, just picked, he just picked up a stretch from Stump's Smokers. Oh, Stump, man. Hope you got to meet the fellow, man. Stump's cool. Uh, I never met him, but I saw him on the barbecue pitmasters and all that. He says, I uh, really like it, and nice not having to tend to a fire like I do on my... Offset. Uh, love your videos and keep up the great work. Cheers to you. Yeah, I remember seeing Stump using his, his gravity feed uh, smoker on uh, that Pitmaster show. It looked, like a, it looked like a nice pit. I mean, it really did. From what I remember, it was a lot larger than Stumpy, too. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm, I'm just excited you got a, a nice smoker, man. So uh, enjoy it. It's going to be a great summer. I appreciate the support, man. Jonathan Havens. How you doing, Jonathan? Good to hear from you, man. Cheers to you. Man, it's getting hot out here. Jonathan, what you got for me, boy? Hey, Troy, got a question for you. You smoked all three kinds of briskets from Lobel's. Can you please let us know which one you like the best? The USDA Prime, 
the natural prime or the wagyu thanks buddy always appreciate everything you do for your subs cheers you know honestly out of those three karen and i like the natural prime the best um the natural prime just had more flavor um the wagyu was nice it was really super tender but it had more of a it had more of that nutty buttery flavor from the wagyu being so marbled I, I actually prefer the beefy flavor and out of the primes the natural prime had the best flavor from what Karen and I tasted but uh, they're all good I mean you know every one of them is gonna be good <laughs> and uh, when I did that natural prime video I'll put it up here for you um, when I did that natural prime video I actually used a recipe from the Lobel's website they've got some fantastic recipes on their website folks I, I made a mopping sauce that was uh, from the Lobel family and put their rub together and made their homemade rub to this day Karen still talks about that brisket it was fabulous it was really really a good brisket man natural prime uh, thanks for the question appreciate it Jonathan the think tank uh, hey Troy thanks again for the video you're welcome appreciate the support Says I've been meaning to ask, do I, do I need to use the charcoal ring thing that comes with the Weber Smoky Mountain? You don't have to, but it helps with the airflow going around the charcoal. But uh, you don't really have to. Um, same, you don't have to use the charcoal baskets that come with your Weber kettle. Well, you can just lay the charcoal in there on, along the wall if you want. It's not going to hurt. It's enamel coated. He says, uh, I have the smaller 18 and a half, and I feel like I can't put as much fuel in there because it raises it up so high close to the water pan. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Um, if you're just needing to put extra charcoal in there, then yeah, take that ring out, man. Shouldn't hurt anything at all. Should work fine. Um, let's see. Next question is from Schultz34. Do you coat the entire smoker with oil on the outside or just the firebox? I guess you're talking about my Yoder Wichita. I coat the entire outside when I do coat it, and that's not that often. Uh, I do coat the firebox more often because the firebox is actually what uh, the paint's peeled off away from it. So it's exposed metal right there. Uh, the rest of my pit is still uh, painted pretty good. If I see a little rust spot, I may, I may just hit it with a, a rag with some damp, uh, some oil on it. <clears throat> but usually I just wipe wipe the the, uh, the cooking chamber itself down with a, a damp rag because it's still got the paint on it. And uh, maybe once a year I'll make coat it with oil, the entire thing. Uh, let's see, Schultz34 says, Should I wait until I start seeing rust or paint flaking off or should I apply a coat of oil now? Uh, you, can, you can wait until it starts showing little signs of uh, paint flaking off and stuff. Um, that's what I did. I mean, I, I think when I first got my smoker, I did oil it down. But you don't really have to. I mean, it's got a, a coating of paint on there to help protect it. But yeah, once you start seeing little spots where the paint's flaking off, go ahead and, and zap it with some, uh, some oil. And then uh, if it's a large enough area, like the firebox area, go ahead and fire the pit up after you oil it down and let that oil absorb into the metal a little bit and that'll help it. Roll Tide, Chris from Alabama. Oh, Chris, that's Schultz. Okay, Schultz 34 is Chris. Roll Tide, hook 'em horns. <laughs> uh, Jack Thompson. Jack says, Hey, Troy, I was wondering if you could possibly do an Australian style barbecue. Excuse me, he says, um, That would be really cool for us over here. Hey, Jack, man, I'd be happy to. Send me a recipe, buddy. Send me a recipe. I'll be happy to, to accommodate you on that one. Uh, let's see. Or maybe my buddy Moose, who I know is watching, send me some recipes, Moose. I'll just go check out your channel, too. I guess I could do that for an Australian-style barbecue. <coughs> Moose Down Under is what I'm talking about. Link down below. Stuart Lowe says, Hi, Troy. Stu is my name. I hail from Australia. Getting some Australians in the house. Howdy, mate. Appreciate the question, Stu. Uh, says, uh, I've been subbed for a year or two now. Thanks for the awesome content. You're quite welcome. Thanks for the subscription and uh, appreciate the support, man. And thanks for the question here. I have a question for you Thursday chats. 
I've had a Kamado Joe for a few years now and I love it. But I'm eyeing off a real offset and would like your explanation on the difference between a regular offset and a reverse flow. Says I have an understanding of how the reverse flow works, but I'm a bit shady on the benefits and differences between the two. Thanks in advance, mate, and keep up the great work. Um, well, yeah, the, uh, the offset design, just your standard offset, you got a firebox on one end and you got a stack on the other. Fuel is in the firebox, the, the wood, and it heats up the cooking chamber and then flows out the stack. With a reverse flow, you've got the smokestack on the same end as the firebox. So, and you've got a plate under your cook, on, under your food, under the grill, grate, grill grates. I can't talk. Um, so the fire and the heat enters into the cooking chamber, goes under the meat, and I guess the, the plate in there kind of does warm up, but you don't get a lot of heat coming up, or smoke for that matter. All of the heat and smoke go to the far end, away from the away from the firebox on the reverse flow, and then they curve back up, and then come over the top of the meat. So usually with a reverse flow, you've got more constant temperatures within the cooking chamber, from side to side. That's one benefit of them if you like to have your entire cooking chamber be the same temp. Personally, I don't. I like mine to have a little variance, 50 to 75 degrees is what I've got my Yoder set. Um, I actually prefer that so I can cook different meats at the same time. And um, they both they both will give a, a nice smoke flavor to your meat. Uh, one thing that the reverse flow probably is better at is it won't, uh, since you're not getting a ton of heat coming up from the, underneath the meat, the heat's flowing over the top of the meat, you don't get that burnt crust on the bottom of your food that you would if you just have an offset with some tuning plates in there or a heat management plate like I do. Um, sometimes if that fire gets really hot it'll actually burn the rub on the bottom side of my meat if I'm not careful and uh, that it's, it's nice it tastes good it's crispy you know but uh, but sometimes that can happen on a regular offset instead of a reverse, reverse float so I hope that helps and if any of you got any other advice or opinions about regular offset compared to a reverse flow offset, chime in. Again, we're a community. We help each other out. So if you have knowledge of this, feel free to put it in the comments. I appreciate it. And I'm sure that uh, Stu would appreciate it as well. Great question, Stu. Thanks, man. Appreciate the support from all the way down under. Let's see what else we got. I don't want this to go too long here. Uh, all right. I'll do one more page here. How about that? I'm almost done, though. Heck, I might as well finish this up. I'll try to be quick here. Small Town Barbecue. What is kosher beef and why is it so expensive? Brisket being $11.99 a pound. Uh, kosher beef from what I gather it just means that it was it was harvested and packaged in standard with the way that uh, kosher uh, the Jewish you know religion has to have things kosher and the meat was actually prepared you know slaughtered butchered packaged prepared according to kosher standards that uh, were set forth you know, by the, the, the Israeli people. So, as far as I know, that's the way it goes. It's kind of like uh, Kobe beef has to be from a certain region in Japan, from Kobe, Japan. So, you know, same, same kind of thing. Elton's BBQ Pit. Elton's Barbecue. How you doing, Jatil? Appreciate it, man. All the way from Norway. I got fans all around the world, man. This is great. This is cool. All right, Jatil says, a question I just heard about brisket, East Texas style, and as I understand it, it is boiled for several hours before it's put on the grill for some amount of time. Have you done brisket this way? And if not, could you do it and share your experience with that? Thanks, for, thanks again for some good entertainment, and cheers, brother, Jatil. Cheers to you, brother. Appreciate it. never heard of boiling brisket unless you're doing like um, 
corned beef. Um, I could try it. You know, I like to experiment, so I can definitely try it, but I've never seen it or heard of it. And, um, Jatil, send me a link to what you're talking about, man. I'll be happy to take a look at it and see if I can do one. Uh, but uh, thanks for the suggestion. Be sure to send me that link, though. That way I have an idea what you're talking about. Riches River Smokers, West Virginia. Hey, Troy, longest video yet. Love that James in there. <laughs> yeah, man. Me and James had a good time, bro. We did. And, uh, man, this video me and Justin just did last week, that was over an hour. That was, that was a lot of fun, too. So if y'all saw that, I appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, Rich's River Smokers, West Virginia. Y'all go check him out down below, man. Rich is a cool dude, man. He's got a, he's, I wonder if he's up to three, 350 subs or something now. He's trucking right along, man. He's gaining subs faster than I did when I was his, uh, my channel was his, his, as young as his is. So he's got it going on, man. Keep up the good work, Rich. Anyway, he says, uh, question, at what point did you realize that your YouTube channel was going to be successful? Uh, I never really, I honestly gave it much thought, man. I just do my thing and, uh, I guess you, you can tell you're kind of successful when people recognize you. Like when I go into a grocery store here in Austin and people recognize me. Uh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But, uh. Yeah, you know, I still consider myself like a rookie, man. I've been doing this right at six years now, a little over six years. Anyway, um, their channels with millions of subscribers. I'm not even a hundred thousand yet. I'm getting there, but uh, you know, thanks to all your help, I appreciate all all of you helping mention my channel to your friends and family and sharing on social media and stuff. That really helps a lot. But I, I'm still, you know, I do what I can, but. As I mentioned before, I'm not really a numbers kind of guy. It's just my own thing. I just lay back and roll with the flow. Stephanie Jimenez, can you bake a cake on your barbecue? Yes, I definitely can do that. That sounds like a fun time, man. <clears throat> can you do a shout out to William and I? You got it, Stephanie. William and Stephanie, there's your shout out. Appreciate the support. Hope y'all doing good and uh, cheers to you. <clears throat> uh, let's see, Jacob Entz, you've talked, you've talked of maybe getting a bigger and more expensive offset smoker. Much respect to the Wichita. Yeah, <laughs> I like my Wichita, man. However, in getting a larger offset smoker, what is the real need? Is it the ease of use? I think of how many people can the Wichita feed. You're getting me to consider buying a stick burner offset smoker. How might one judge the size that they may invest in? You are much appreciated. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I don't really remember mentioning that I'm going. That I was thinking about getting a larger offset. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with my Wichita, honestly. It's usually just Karen and I, unless I'm doing a, a, a party for friends, friends and family or something. But then I've got the Wichita, I've got the Weber Smoky Mountain, I've got the Kamado Joe, I got the Weber kettle now. I mean, I can smoke on all of those. I can cook barbecue on all of those. I've got the barrel pit barrel cooker. Uh, I've got plenty enough smokers and grills. I don't need any any larger one. Um, but you know, get what you can afford. That'd be my advice. You know, it, if you can afford the better well made smokers, I would suggest you do that because it's going to save you more in the long run. With fuel and you're not going to have to add wood as often as you would one that leaks like a sieve you know if you got smoke billowing out everywhere uh, it's going to burn that wood a lot quicker uh, so for me again it's usually just Karen and I and the Wichita is plenty big enough in fact I think it's got two shelves in it I think I've only used that second shelf the upper shelf once most of the time, the bottom shelf is plenty enough. It's big enough for me. So uh, if you got a large, you know, if you got like eight kids and you want to cook them a nice barbecue, you may need a bigger one, you know? So <laughs> they got some nice ones out there, man. Gator Pits, uh, Shirley Manufacturing, Lone Star Grills. Um, of course, Yoder makes some bigger ones. My buddy Joe over at Southern Coastal Cooking, he's got the Kingman. That's a big pit, man. <laughs> Woo. All right, 
Appreciate the question, Jacob. Matt Walker, hey T Roy. I'd like to cook my first brisket whole my first brisket whole and have yet to do so. But I will not do anything other than basic salt and pepper. Now the Packer style brisket, I would like to do naked and need to know when cooking it. Do you place the bigger end to the firebox or the thinner end? Also, water is always used in my pit. Um, you know what I usually do? I would say put the larger end towards the firebox. Uh, the other way you can do it is just put the brisket lengthwise, lengthwise so that one side of the brisket, not one end, but one side of the brisket is facing the firebox. I've done that before, and that works out pretty good. But, uh, yeah, I would, I would say go with the thicker part towards your firebox, because that's usually where most of the heat is. But that depends on how you have your tuning plate spaced or your heat management plate spaced. You know, so on some pits, for instance, it's hotter towards the smokestack end than it is the firebox. So if you've got your brisket like on the on the stack end, you may want to have your brisket point the th the thicker part of the brisket pointing towards the stack if it's hotter on that end. So it depends. I would put the, the thicker part of the brisket towards where the where the heat is. But great question, man. Appreciate the question. <clears throat> do 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 I think you're gonna love that naked brisket too, man. That's some good stuff. Really nice bark. Sous vide everything. Yep, you got a channel too. Y'all check him out down below. Good stuff. Sous vide, good. I need to get me a sous vide machine. My brother T Roy got a question for you. If you had to choose one type of meat to eat for the rest of your life, what would that be? You are a master of all meats, so I'm curious to find out your reply. Let me know, brother. Oh, man, I love a good ribeye. I could probably eat ribeye every day. That'd be my that'd be my meat, the ribeye. Um, second choice, I'd probably say uh, St. Louis ribs. I like St. Louis ribs a lot. Appreciate the question. And again, y'all go check him out. Le Sabre, 1972. Le Sabre, y'all been around a long time. Cheers to you, man. Appreciate you asking questions and thanks for the support. Do you ever smoke any fish? And if so, could you have a show of it? Yeah, I do smoke fish. Uh, not too often, though. As I mentioned before, a lot of times the fish will give you a, a weird flavor in your in your pit. Uh, same with your, your gas grills and stuff, too. Uh, so I usually don't cook fish on my offset. I have cooked salmon on it, and it turned out fabulous. Man, it was good. I should, I should probably do that for y'all one day, some smoked salmon or some other smoked fish. But uh, somebody asked for me to do some kind of a catfish cordon bleu or something like that. I can't remember. But so, cubion? Catfish cubion maybe? So I'm, I got that. I'm, I'm going to work on that too. So uh, y'all stay tuned for some of that. But um, yeah, I'll definitely do some smoked fish for you. Okay, how about that? Thanks for the suggestion. Thanks for the support. Olsen's got Ock Black Bladad. Okay, Olsen's. <laughs> hey, Troy, could you do a video when you make taco meat on the Weber Smoky Mountain? I could do that. Um, I'll be honest with you, I've never done taco meat on a smoker. That'd be interesting, though. Definitely would be. Um, I've smoked, like, skirt steak and flank steak for, like, fajitas. That turned out fabulous. But I, when, I, when I'm thinking taco meat, I'm thinking, like, ground meat. I've never done that on a smoker, but I bet that would be interesting, man. I mean, I've smoked hamburgers and stuff, but not, not loose ground meat is what I'm getting at. But thanks for the suggestion. I appreciate it. Alan Donnelly. How you doing, Alan? Cheers, buddy. All right, Alan, what you got for me, man? Hey, Troy, great video as always. A quick question for you. Thanks. Appreciate it. He says, uh, I always brine my chickens before I roast them in the oven makes a world of difference yeah it does man it really gives them a nice not only a, a flavor but it helps keep them juicy big time juicy man do you think branding a chicken before smoking on the Weber Smoky Mountain would be of any benefit uh, do you think it would affect the smoke penetration at all cheers buddy yep I have uh, I've actually done that and yes it does work fabulously I ha haven't noticed that it hurts any of the uh, 
smoke getting into the meat. So I think you're I think you're good with that. But definitely brining chicken, regardless of how you're gonna cook it, that chicken turns out really super super juicy and moist, man. Really good stuff. But um, great question. I appreciate it, Alan. And uh, again, cheers to you, buddy. Thanks for the support, folks. I finished up that list. Now I got to go print me another one for next week. And I think I'm caught up until I went on vacation, which was, I think was episode 30 or 31. The ones that I didn't reply or respond to the comments on. I think there was two of them. Two Thursday chats I didn't respond because I was on vacation. So, uh, so we'll pick back up with the questions from those episodes. And then we'll get try to get caught up. And um, again, I appreciate y'all's support. Thanks for all the great questions. Y'all keep them coming in. If you've got a question for me, just ask it in the comments down below. Please check out the uh, description box. Just hit show more beneath the video. It'll open that description box. There's a ton of information in there for you. And uh, please go ahead and support the YouTube channels that I list down in the description. I'm sure they would appreciate it. But folks, y'all like this kind of stuff. Y'all want to see me keep coming to you? Y'all give me some thumbs up. Thanks again for everything. Couldn't do this without all of you. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Appreciate it. And hope to get some more new, some new YouTubers up here to help me do some of these Thursday chats here before too much longer. Uh, so that's in the works. But anyway, y'all give some thumbs up. Hope y'all share this video. And when you do, please tell all your friends. T. Roy cooks responsibly. Cheers, everybody. See y'all next Thursday.